This is Sid Roth saying, I have a vision. Now is the set time to blow the trumpet in Zion. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound it on the mountain. Blow a trumpet in Zion, for the day of the Lord is come. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound it on the mountains. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Mishbucha. Shalom, family. Mishpocha is a Hebrew word. It means family. And we're the Mishpocha, the family with a Jewish heart, made up of Jewish, non-Jewish people that are brand new creations in the Messiah, getting ready, Mishpocha, to blow the grandest shofar, or the grandest trumpet in Zion. We want everyone, everywhere to hear the good news. My guest, not by way of telephone, surprise, right here in the studio is Wilma Stanchfield. And recently, I was guest hosting a television show in the Clearwater, Florida area. And uh, several of my guests were at a women's conference. And they gave me the brochure, Wilma, and your picture was there and your testimony. And this intrigued me. And that's make a long story short. That's why you're here today. But, uh, Wilma, I'm going to take you back to August 1956. That's a date, uh, a month that you will never forget. Before we even take you back to that date, tell me, bef before that date, what your belief in Jesus was. I didn't have a belief in Jesus. I really, um, I had been placed in a Sunday school uh, church situation when I was 12 years of age because my father uh, had become a Christian, and he was a single parent raising his two children, and uh, he had found out the reality of Jesus Christ and what he had done for um, my dad on the on the cross and my dad was totally without any resources I and mean, he was having a hard time with two rebellious children and so he embraced Christ right now and he began to uh, pray for his two children and uh, he he also placed us in Sunday school and church I never listened I like a lot of kids, I suppose, I, I just wasn't into listening. I, I'm just kind of curious, if it's possible, going back then, why? Why weren't you interested in going to heaven? Why weren't you interested in not going to hell? Why weren't you interested in a vital relationship with God? Why weren't you interested in being able to hear God's voice and, and He has a destiny and a good plan for your life? How could you not be interested? I know it's a sound from this perspective now I, I I really had a problem didn't I but that's a problem that I think is very common with kids I mean they don't care to listen they know everything and we don't really know anything but we think we do and my dad his prayers used to drive me crazy he prayed in a loud voice he talked like somebody was right there in the room with him I couldn't see him I thought what is he doing this for my dad um, he embarrassed me I felt like all the neighbors knew he was praying for his his wayward daughter. Now, do you know exactly how he prayed for you? Yes. Tell me. Uh, it won't be the exact words, but he used to pray, Father, I know your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for my two children, just like he died on the cross for me. And I want you to protect the lives of my two children. I want you to put a hedge about their lives. I don't want the enemy to be able to touch them or harm their lives until such a time as they come to the point of realizing that the very reason they are here on planet Earth is to make a decision where they're going to spend their real life, which is eternal. And so God protect them and don't let anything touch them until they understand they've got to make a decision about your son, Jesus Christ, and what has been done for them. And so and basically he was saying, take care of my kids and don't let anything take them until their brains kick in, you know? And my brain didn't kick in, Sid. You, you, okay. <laughs> now, let's take it. You're married, August 1956. Uh, uh, you're on a camping trip. Where right. is this? Um, it's in International Falls. It's just as far north as you go in Minnesota. And uh, it's a it's a town noted for its inclement weather, and it's really not so hot in August either. D did you or your husband have any premonition uh, that your life was about ready to be no, threatened? No, no. I had only been married for two years, and I married, um, I got a package deal. I got a wonderful husband and twin sons, age 14, and a beautiful daughter, age 18. Now, what was his belief at that time? Nothing. Nothing? And it just Two nothings got together. Two nothings got together. <laughs> well, I think basically everyone... Uh, feels like, well, you know, sure, I'm a Christian. I mean, I'm, I'm not Jewish. 
So anyone not Jewish is a Christian. Yeah. That's, no, that's what we Jewish people think. I right. didn't know that you Gentiles <laughs> thought that. <laughs> but I, I, I think that's basically what you think. And my husband had been in Sunday school and church as a child, too. But, it, you know, he didn't really... You, don't, you know all about God. I knew that, that Jesus Christ, I'd heard that he died on the cross for the world. He didn't die on the cross for the world. He died for you. And he died for me. It's personal. And I didn't know that. That's the biggest kept secret for boneheads like me. Wilma, we have people on the edge of their seat wanting to know what horrific thing happened to you and your husband at this camping trip. Well, we had been on the camping trip for five days and incidentally I didn't know it was supposed to be my vacation and I didn't know that men had different ideas of vacation than women I mean I thought you got to eat out in style you know and didn't have to wash dishes and they have a wilderness camping well which to me you got a lot of gall calling that a vacation and so I didn't know that I wasn't having a good time at first because I'd never done this before and uh, I thought it was happening, but I wasn't really. Because what I was doing was cook, 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 and then they'd eat, eat, eat. And then I'd wash dishes, wash dishes, and then... You're, they, you're not getting my sympathy at oh, all. But I didn't that's, like <laughs> <I'm teasing you. laughs> And so, it, but one thing, we were on Rainy Lake. And uh, Rainy Lake, when they name the lakes in Minnesota, they mean it. It, it. it implies something you should know about the lake. It wasn't raining that day, but five days later, it started to rain. And... Two boatloads of people had come in for our island. We were 40 miles out on an island called Shelland Island on uh, Rainy Lake, International Falls. These people felt they were there was going to be a storm. They said, may we take shelter on this island with you? My husband said, you know, welcome to our island, you know. Wilma get the coffee. And I'm thinking, I don't think I'm having a good time. Now I've got to be the hostess for all these people. And uh, so I was sort of unhappy. My husband began to reassure the people that he was a Minnesotan. He knew his weather. And at that moment, there was a horrendous crash of thunder. And, and uh, he said, but we better take shelter for a little while. It'll be over. And so there were nine people that had taken shelter on these, um, in these two boats. And the twins had two tents. We had our tent. There was an old dilapidated building, maybe been a fishing shack. It was in a state of disrepair. The roof was gone, uh, mostly. Half of it was totally gone. One wall was missing. And then the people from the two boats ran into this old building. My husband was running for the tent. The boys were running for their two tents. And he turned around to see where I am. And I was still standing at the cooking station. And he said, come on, honey, come to the tent. And so I, at that point, headed for the tent. And I was really angry. I was going to get inside the tent and tell my husband what I thought of his idea of a vacation. I wasn't going to do it out in front of everybody, but I was really going to tell him. And so I'm trying to get in the tent, and the entrance way to a tent isn't double French doors where you can go bang them and make a statement. You know, I'm mad. Actually, the entrance way to a tent is really, its you have to di bend over in an undignified position to get in. And the, this wet canvas was slapping me, and I was slapping it back. I'm entangled to the netting, and my husband is tapping me on the shoulder. And he said, honey, turn around. I want you to see something. And I tried to hold my position halfway in, halfway out, and turn around and see what he had. And as I turn around, he puts his arm around me. And with his other hand, he takes my chin, and he's holding me in the flap way of the tent. He said, honey, I want you to look at this. I just want you to look at the lake. And I thought, well, what, what's the punchline? I mean, I'm surrounded by it. I, we're on an island. I've seen it from every angle. He said, it's worth the whole trip, Wilma, to see scenery like this. And I thought, he's serious. He said, look at the roiling waves, the cloud formations. That's just awesome, Wilma. And I think to myself, I went with you for four years. I've been married to you for two. And you like this. I hate it. My whole six years are shot. I'm th and he said, you know what, honey? I said, what? He said, I think I'll take a picture of it. And I said, well, why not? you got to let go of my chin in order to reach the camera. <laughs> he leans over to get the camera, and his arm that's around my shoulder slips off, and it's somewhere in the mid-vicinity of my spine. And he never connected with the camera. At that moment, a bolt of lightning shot through his neck. His ears exploded. His hair began to singe, burn on his head. The bolt of lightning went through his arm, through his hand. I took a bolt the size of a dinner plate that went in my back and came out the front of me, still the size of a dinner plate. All those people on that island were 
thrown galley end up, just like rag dolls from the blast that hit us. You could be so close to a blast of lightning that you can be in a state of shock. Every one of the people, their system, they said it was the most gruesome, awesome sound, they, like the atomic bomb. Did you have any idea what was happening? No, I never heard a thing I never saw. When you're struck directly, you don't hear it. You go beyond. Uh, you become like one with the elements. And I, w I went out of my body. My husband went out of his body. I knew I had no. I did not lose consciousness. Did I, you Did you see him out of his body, or no, did he see you? No. Okay. I was total. I was never so alone in my whole life, and I just. I I didn't know where I was. My my mind continued to function. I wasn't using my brain. I'm out of my body, and I don't know where. And it's like I was doing. Had this that. ever happened to you before? Never. No. I had never been. So were you so, afraid? What, I, what, what kind of emotion were you feeling? I mean, this is a... My uh, first emotion was, I wonder if he knows he's got his arm around nothing. I'm not there. I'm out here. I don't know where I am. He, at the same time, did is you feel any? That. Did you feel any pain or discomfort? I mean, you, you, you've just been hit with lightning. No, I don't. I just... I, it was me. I'm not in my body. I know my body's down there, but I know I'm out here. And So you I, could see him holding your body? Not, not no. really. I had this thought. I wonder if he knows I'm, I'm leaving. I I'm see. gone now. And, you know, I'm, does he know I'm out? I didn't know that he was going through the same thing. And I had so many things. At, I was 32. My dad, at that point, had been praying for me for 20 years. That wall of protection. I'm only, I am here. Do you think you would be dead today and in hell if, if your dad my, did not pray for you? Yes, I mean, you. I mean, you can't get much. You can't get any more de dead than than no. being hit from lightning no. like that. There aren't too many that take a bolt directly and live through it. And I know that I'm a product of my father's prayers. I mean, God does answer prayer, and my father, that I didn't care for anything he had to offer, is the reason I'm sitting here alive today. And I had all these things that were wrong that I used to think, I wonder what you do with things like this. I used to try to change the subject to myself, sweep them under the carpet and think about it some other time. I didn't have time. I was too busy uh, with life, having fun. And we, we were having a good marriage. It was, you know, it was a party marriage. It was great. And, uh, and now all of a sudden, I'm dying, and I know it. I thought, man, I'm too young. I'm too young to die. I'm only 32. Wilma, our time is up. And the lightning hit it went through your husband. Uh, where did it go? What part of his body did it go through? It went through his neck. Through his neck. And his uh, ears uh, ruptured. And uh, his hair began to burn on his head. Uh, we, he had considerable burns. It went through his arm, through his hand, and into my back. It, you know, it was his body couldn't stop it at all. It went right through right his through. body into. It's almost like I can picture someone uh, uh, if you shot someone with a, a bullet. It, it would go through the first person, and then if the first person was in front of a second person, it would right. enter that second person. Right. And we didn't see it, but they said that the ball lightning, which is very few people really make it through a ball lightning, from what I understand. But they said they saw the ball of lightning roll and hit the lake after hitting us, and all the fish were dead belly up in the bay. You know, it's Whatever the people that, that were around saw saw the, this happen. The people that were on the island. Did anyone see the the lightning hit you and your husband? It knocked every person down, and all the report we had was I they know, saw say, the ball I, I've lightning. Heard, I've heard thunder, but I've never really seen the lightning strike. And, and you're saying that when this strikes, people all around can feel it. They did. Can they feel heat? I don't huh. know. I really don't know. Okay. But it, it's a, a sh they okay. were in shock. And, and then the thing that's so amazing to me, and this had never happened to you before, nor has it happened <laughs> to most people that are listening to us right now, you found yourself out of your body, and what were your first thoughts and feelings? My first thought out of my body is, what is happening to me, and does my husband know I'm leaving, and I'm not down there. He's got his arm around nothing because he had had his arm around me in the flapway of the tent trying to get me to admire the beauty of the storm, and uh, that's when it happened. And I'll tell you, it's a terrible time to die when you're really upset with your husband. <laughs> I mean, I was really upset with him, and I didn't think it was all that beautiful. And then the next thing, Zowie, and I'm out of my body, and I had 
the experience. I don't know how to say, but everything that had ever been wrong in my life, it was just like, boom, there, you know. And it was. In other words, you could see your life before you. Is that, that sort of thing? In in that in, in the in, sense. In that sense. I hope it was more to my life than the things I saw. It was well, everything wrong. What? Uh, tell me, if I'm not being too personal, tell me some of the wrong things you saw. Oh, I, I don't. I just never have talked about that. It's nothing that I really want to talk about. All the things that kids do and the things that you, the lies I told. And the, my mother, you see, had divorced my father when I was six years of age. And uh, I was, I would, because of that experience, I had become a very rebellious child. My father was having trouble. His son was three years old. His daughter was six. From the time my mother left, my little boy my little brother played with my dolls. I never touched a doll again. I, what I did is I went around hitting people. And I beat up my little brother. I beat up. I didn't care. So I, these sort of things just flashed before you yes. of the things you've done that are wrong. Okay, now you see what, what a mess you are. You didn't see yes. it before. Yes. You see what a mess. You don't even have your body anymore. So what do you do now? And then I, I, the next thing, I can't find words said to explain what I want to say now. I do the best I can in my book. But I... I was absolutely consumed with the totality and the reality of Almighty God. It was like pure knowledge. I just knew that there is a God. I never doubted that again. He filled every every pore of my being with the reality of God. And I'm, I, I can't find a word to use except glory. I was overwhelmed with the glory of God. It was as though I was given one instant to see what could have been, to realize I'm not going toward him. I am going away from him. And I was going like slow motion in wheelies, and I was going into a blackness that the word dark or black won't touch. And I didn't want to go away from God. I begin, I learned how to pray. Immediately, I begin to beg. I'll tell you, now I lay me down to sleep. Won't cut it right then. I, it, I tried to think of some wor God words to say to God. And I, I, I started the 23rd Psalm. I don't even know, didn't even know that I knew the first uh, verses of the 23rd song because I had never but some Sunday school teacher maybe in some way that penetrated my head I started saying the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want and a whole my whole mind I knew I don't even know what shepherd means I want I want to live I be I begin to beg oh God let me live oh I know you're real I'll be good I'll be like daddy I'll go to church I'll do good things God I promise you I'll do anything for you God let me live I don't think I'm alive because of the eloquent prayers I was making at that moment. Why are you alive? I'm alive because of my father. My father's prayers that started for me when I was 12 years of age. He's been praying for 20 years. I'm 32. He didn't know I'd been struck by lightning. But, you know, with God, there is no time. I mean, my father's prayers, I was covered with you, prayer. You really, you really see the value of prayer. Oh, do I ever. It's the greatest resource. Someone said once, the greatest regret we will have when we get to heaven is when we find out how little we used, as you put it, this greatest resource. Right. So, right. so you're, you're having this conversation. You, you feel that you're going, you're being, is it almost sucked or pulled towards this darkness? Yes. And then what? And then I, what I share now, I, I just blacked out. I went into the black. And that's I, I that's all I can remember. My husband, in his separateness, in his dying, was talking to God and using the twenty-third Psalm of all things as he, and he his prayer differed from mine. If you want to put hats on people, really, my husband is the guy in the white hat, and I'm the guy in the black hat because my husband is just he was a really nice person. He was a good person, humanly speaking. Um, he just he started praying, oh God. Let my t my sons are too young to be fatherless. I'll tell them about you. Oh God, let me live. I I know you're real. And he, he that's the kind. I'm just praying for me, boy. Mm -hmm. I want to live. My I wasn't a, what you call a nice person. I I wore facades um, to cover up. I finally quit hitting kids, and hitting people when I was 13 because I didn't have any friends left. And uh, you don't when you're hitting people. So then I sort of started a mask factory. And I, I put on a face or a facade to be whatever you wanted me to be. And I was in but that. You, but, you know, most people do that. And the unfortunate thing, Wilma, 
A lot of believers do that, and they don't realize there's nothing to hide. No. If, you, if Jesus is your Lord and you're dead to self, you want to. You don't want to hide your light under. You want to show it. But why do people put on these facades? You, you did it, I guess, just because you. The same uh, reason that uh, Adam and Eve put on the fig leaves. To hide sin. To hide. Yeah, we don't want anything messing with our lifestyles, and it's so sad. Because if I think if everyone, if all the churches and everyone would get away from all the traditions and the, the rules and everything that are set up, that being a Christian means this and that. A Christian means that you know Jesus Christ. It's a gift. It's from the Father to us. And if, you, if anyone could just know that asking Christ into your life, is, it doesn't cramp your style. It enhances your style. You have freedom. You don't have to wear masks anymore. I've taken off the mask. I tell the truth now. I never told the truth before. You want to know what happened when I saw it myself. I was a, I was a liar. I was always a... And, and you know, I'm reminded, is it in Revelations it says liars will not go to heaven? Right, right. right. But, but anyway, we're getting ahead of our story. So there you are, struck with lightning, pretty much yelling to God for help, coming up with the only scripture you probably knew, and then you black out. I mean, you, you, at first you felt the presence of God, then you felt pulling towards darkness, then right. you're blacked out, then what's your next memory? My next memory is, well, what actually happened is the, the I want to tell you why I'm alive. Okay. <laughs> this is so fantastic, because those people that had taken shelter on the island, there were two boatloads. In the first boat, there were two husband and wife teams. And the, as the men tried to get to their feet, they were in a state of shock. Smoke was billowing out of our tent, and the stench of burning flesh and hair is a terrible smell. It was permeating the air. And the boys, saw, they saw what was left of our tent, and they started screaming, help us, help us. And the two men in that first boat tried to come to give assistance. And one man looked at the condition of our bodies, and he literally became sick. And the other man became um, just hysterical. He said, it's too late. In the second boat that landed on that island that day, there was a lady and her husband and a 15-year-old daughter. And this lady had had, she was seven months pregnant, and she had had a course a few months prior in CPR. When you're struck by lightning, what you die from is before burns or anything else that attends the strike of lightning, you suffocate. You go into cardiac arrest, and you can't breathe, and your heart stops. If someone could be there that knew CPR, you could maybe have your life. I call this quite a coincidence that a woman who has CPR at that point in time would be on that point of land. She gave instruction to her daughter. She fell down on her knees, began to work on my husband, and she said, work on her quickly. Do what I'm doing. There's no time. I call it a miracle that a girl, 15, who has not had any training, could pick it up accurately enough that I, too, could have my life come back in my body. And then the, the fishing guide and the husband of this woman jumped in the boat, which is a foolhardy thing in a storm. They went out on that lake. They went down the lake to find a man they knew had a cruiser. They said, if we can get these people breathing, we got to get them to the hospital. And these great people go out in that storm. They bring this cruiser back. In the meantime... We had started taking, I don't remember any of that, but our first shallow breaths, our erratic heartbeat. It wasn't a whole bunch of life. We were totally paralyzed, but we were breathing again. They placed us in the bottom of the cruiser, and they went across six, uh, 40 miles of water to the shore of International Falls, rushed us to the hospital. Shock had set in at this point, and our vital signs were closing down again. When they brought us in the hospital, the doctor his prognosis was very dismal. He said, I don't think they're not going to make it. Um, they just really greased the sheets on two beds in the same room, which is a, not according to law in Minnesota. You didn't put a man and woman in the same room together, even if they're married. But due to the fact they thought they're going to expire, they greased the sheets, laid our gross bodies, pulled our burnt clothing off. I, 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 I don't understand. What do you mean greased the sheets? They put, they slathered the sheets with a grease. For what purpose? Because we were burned. Oh, I see. Okay, go ahead. And then uh, they didn't give us, they, what they did is they, they think we're dying. So they gave us grease sheets, you know. I mean, we don't know where they're going, but let's make them comfortable while they're on their way. They put another grease sheet up over us, and they said that it's probably better that they don't 
live because probably the nerve end damage alone to their bodies, up to 80% of the nerve endings are probably burned away. And they uh, Wilma Stanchfield, I'm sorry, our time is up. They, they take you and your husband, because both of you were struck with lightning, put you on grease sheets in a hospital, then take another grease sheet, because you're so burned on, uh, how much burning was there on my both husband, of your body? We had burn, I had this, the burn going through my back and out the front where the bolt had gone, and it was the size of a dinner plate, and I had burns on my legs. My husband had burns more extensive than me, but... Uh, did, they, did they say, did they feel there was any chance of you two living? Actually, um, they said that there was no chance, that we were going to expire. Yeah, that's why they just threw the sheet on right. you and then threw another one on right. top of you. Now, and perhaps they would have given us some life support system of some kind. But at that moment, that was the way they left us for just a moment. And we were in those two beds, and I, all of a sudden, my eyes began to focus on the ceiling. My husband, his mind began to function in the bed next to me. And... All of a sudden, his eyes focused, and he turned, and he saw something in the bed next to him, and he thought, what is it? And I'm thinking, where am I? And I turned, and I saw him. And he didn't look so hot either. In fact, we were the gruesome twosome. You, you said his hair was all he singed? He singed. And I, a light of recognition seemed to go on behind his eyes. And he said, Wilma, there's a God. And I said... Excuse me, for those who are just, just tuning in, both of them did not believe in God at the, before in the this sense, happened. In the, in the sense, if someone had said, you believe in God, but as far as yeah. him being real. Right, right. I, had, I would have um, really scoffed, and I had done a lot of scoffing in my life up to this point. But he said, he's re he said there is God. God is there. God is. And I turned my head, and I said, I know, and I turned my face away from him. My husband said again, Wilma, there really is a God. And I turned my head back. I'd say, I know. And we just did that for a while. I like the only thing we could think of to do to keep reassuring one another, there is a God. And then I did something totally out of character. I don't understand why I did it. I'm so glad I did it. But I, I turned my head back to my husband in the middle of him telling me, again, there is a God. And I blurted out pure truth. And I wasn't a person given to pure truth statements, but I just... I interrupted him in the middle of him telling me, I said, honey, I wasn't going to be with God. And the shock of the honesty of that statement caused my husband to turn his face to the wall, and he began to cry like a little boy. And I began to cry. And we lay in those two beds, and we shared it gut level, like two little naked kids, what it feels like to die without God. And he said, I told God if he'd let me. I says, I know, I told God if he'd let. And they came in, and they thought, what is going on in here? These people are trying to talk. They're supposed to be dying or dead. And God was doing, he was doing a miracle of restoration of two lives that didn't deserve it. Who does? But were you experiencing pain while you were talking to him, or were you just oblivious to it? No. When your nerve ends, they thought perhaps, and they were correct in the damage done to our bodies. Um, Dr. Brandt, I think, is the author that's written a book about what happens to a person with leprosy, the reason they harm themselves, they don't feel anything. They're when like, your no. nerve ends are destroyed, you don't feel anything. For so how much of your, uh, of your husband's nerve ends were destroyed? Both of us had extensive nerve end damage. They said probably up to 80% of the nerve endings have been mm. burned away. Mm. And yet, here I sit. I, it's almost anticlimactic to tell you this, Sid, but God just totally healed these two people and my husband's fried hair grew back thicker. I mean, his ears, they said he'd never hear adequately again. His ears healed perfectly. Now, what happened to his ears when the lightning they, hit? They exploded. And the, they exploded. It blew his, both ears. Both and eardrums. They, right. And they said it was such that they probably would never be yeah, healing. They were healed perfectly. All the nerve and damage... Every nerve in, in our, we were, first of all, let me say this, we were totally healed of our burns without skin grafting, which blew everyone that, away. That's impossible. It, was, it happened. How, how, how could that it happen? It took three that's months. Not, but wait, wait, wait. There are scientific medical people talk, listening to us now. They, that's impossible. Well, it happened. And not only that, every nerve ending that they said probably could never be repaired to be normal again. Every nerve ending was perfectly healed. It took three months, but that doesn't change the nature of the miracle. God totally healed these two people, and we stood, as it were, on the brink of eternity, and now we're on our feet. 
And we made a vow to God while we were dying. We'd be good. And we know that God is now. And we set out then to try to pay God back. But here's Now, how, how were you going to pay God back? What was your it. What was your goal? Uh, how, what was your method? Well... I, you see, a lot of times people have misunderstood my story. They think I got struck by lightning. I saw the light, and I got my act together. It's that what I when I say I know there's a God. I never doubted God again, boy. I know there's a God, and I know very well you can die and go to hell. I know that. But you see, knowing there is a God and knowing God are two different things. I didn't know Jesus Christ, and that's the way so, you can so, know God. So then you knew. Then you came to know Jesus right right immediately after. No. What, no. did, what did you do immediately? What I did immediately after, as soon as I was healed, my husband and I started out with our kids, and we joined the church. And what, what type of church did you join? Well, we joined the Congregational Church. Would you like to know why? Sure. I know there's a God. I'm going to do everything good for him now. I don't know that I'm so filled with guile that I actually, the pastor, minister, when he came to my house, and he's trying to talk me into joining the congregational church, I said to him, I want to know two things. I want to know if it's true in the congregational church, I have the right to interpret the Bible any way I want. He said, yes, you, that's true. That's our position. All right. Now, the other thing I want to know, and this was about the time of marching in Selma and so forth. Mm -hmm. If a black person were to come in your church, what would be your reaction? That was very important to me because that was my good part. I mean, I, I just was all for judging people by the person. Don't make, I didn't care for prejudice. He said, Wilma, I know what you're saying, and I totally agree with you. I can't speak for my whole congregation. I said, all right, I'll join the church. So I became Mrs. Church. My husband became Mr. Church. We got on all the committees. We were an astonishing, awesome sight, Mr. and Mrs. Church in Technicolor. Oh, well, Mr. and Mrs. Church, um, how long did you remain Mr. and Mrs. Church? Ten years. Ten years. You, you know, my wife had a vision, which I, I really feel um, I should mention to people. And in this vision, she saw Jesus, and he took her by the hand. And they both proceeded down a highway, and they walked into a church. And it was a magnificent church. It was beautiful. And my wife looked up at Jesus, and he was weeping. And she said, why are you weeping? And he said, because they don't know me. And she said, but Lord, they're singing, they're singing songs about how much they love you. Lord, they're in church. Yes, but they don't know me. What does that vision mean to you? Oh, it's so true. It's so true because I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead 10 years now just for a moment to tell you that when I did come to know Christ, my pastor came to call on me. He said, I want to talk to you. He said, why haven't you been in church lately? I've been visiting my neighbor's church. And I said, he said, has something happened to you? I said, oh, yes. I said, something wonderful. He said, now, my, I, another thing I liked about my church was that my pastor had a Harvard accent. And I just thought that it shows how deep and profound my thinking is. But I really admired that. I was nervous when he was going to come and call on me to find out what had happened to me because I thought he probably knows so much and I have just barely become a Christian. And so I said to him, well, Wayne, uh, I said I'd learned a new word, efficacy. And I thought, I'll lay that word on him. And I think I know how to use it. I said, Wayne, I believe in the efficacy of the blood of Christ. To con he said, the what? And I said, well, I thought, shoot, I shouldn't have used that word. I said, you know, the power of the blood to redeem me. He said, oh, Wilma. He said, it could have been the blood of anyone on the cross. Then we got into this scientific dissertation on the properties of blood. It was the idea that a man would love so much that he would die on a cross. Any man could have done it. I go, no, no. It's Look, at I've been born again. He said, I'm born again every morning. Wilma, you could have gone your whole life and not gone to heaven and not known Jesus and it, it was it would have been almost like a placebo you would have thought you were okay because you were doing all these good works yes yes and you know what after this happened I was 33 and I'm 34 and I'm 35 and you know I couldn't help it my face began to ache from smiling I mean I got so I hated the phone and I'm on all the charity boards now, and I, I'm working so hard, and I thought, you know, barring another accident, 
I can live another 40, 50 years. And you mean I got to keep on doing this for 40 or 50? I mean, that is a heavy thought. But immediately, the other thought comes, yes, but you know you can die and go away from God. And how do you know when you've done enough? To me, it was like a pair of scales. And you need ballast on the side where you are because the gift of life restored is so heavy that spiritually speaking, I'm very puny. And so I'm piling all these good things thinking that I'll balance myself out. And at some point, there'll come a voice from outer space that'll say something like, okay, honey, you finally paid me back. If your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, yes. if there is a place called heaven, which you already knew, you'll end up there. Yes. What a lie. What a lie. You know, you know I'm, I'm going to talk to our mishpacha right now. Well. Uh, unfortunately, I believe most Protestants, I, I, know, I know this is a tough statement, but most Protestants and most Catholics may love God, but they don't know him. And if you don't know him, you've missed the whole purpose. If you settle for a placebo called religion and good works, as Wilma and her husband settled for, you've got a sugar pill. Uh, Wilma, you told me your husband should have been deaf. Uh, your nerve endings were all destroyed. Right. I mean, if you had been, if you had lived, you would have both been vegetables. But instead, I'm looking at a woman right now, Mishbucha. I wish we were on television that looks healthy and vibrant and alive. And then for the, but here's the sad part that I want our Mishbucha to understand. That is, you decided. Now you know there is a God. You don't know him, but you know there is a God. You join a church, and you do as many good works as you can, and you reached a point where you told me that it was getting kind of discouraging. Why was it so discouraging? Well, because I couldn't help but think, where's all the joy and peace I thought you were supposed to have when you're good? I mean, I'd never been so good, and I had more joy and peace when I was bad. And all I had behind my my masks was fear i was afraid to die and i didn't dare stop because i i thought i don't know if i've done enough yet so so you served god out of fear and, out of and fear. you never knew you, you had you had this theology that said if my good deeds outweigh my bad yes. deeds I'll, I'll that'll be enough but you never knew what enough was right and there was something wrong with my father i could not figure it out he wasn't impressed by me. I used to cut my picture out of the paper. I'd do something outstanding for a charity or something, and I'd fire it off to him, and I'd say, Look, Daddy, I'm good like you now. And my dad, he just kept on praying for me. He wasn't impressed, and I just couldn't figure out why my father couldn't couldn't appreciate how nice I had become. And he was, on the eighth year past that accident, my father prayed to his father in heaven, and he said, God, if you don't use me in her life, put something in her past with, that will show her the sun. Just look at her. She's trying to earn. She's trying to merit heaven. Now, now was your husband doing the same thing? We were both very, very busy. We were so busy that in that those 10 years, I never told anyone. I want to stress this. In those 10 years, from that time of, of being healed, I never told anyone, nor did my husband, the conversation the two of us had had in that room together about what it was like to go away from God. I didn't want anyone to know I was going to hell. I never, I put, I buried that in the subconscious part of my mind. I think a lot of people do things like that, incidentally. Right at the time it's happening, they are very, very, they're touched in the, de but then they try to sit on it, cover it over. And my husband and I were re really too busy to talk about things like that. We were busy being Mr. and Mrs. Church. But I didn't want anyone to know. And so eight years after the accident, when my dad was praying, I was then 40 years of age, and God answers prayer all the time, every time, on time, at his perfect time. And you can't beat God's timing. That was the year he was going to answer my dad's prayer. All of a sudden, right next door to me, there is a house that is suddenly for sale. Incidentally, at that point in my life, it was eight years after the accident. I was 40 years of age. I had a little three-year-old daughter. I, my stepchildren, my twin sons and my stepdaughter, had been busy making me a grandmother, and I hadn't ever been a mother. They told me I couldn't have children after the lightning, that I should think about adopting. I kept thinking, I'm going to have a child. Well, I didn't. When I was 37, I, we adopted an eight-day-old baby girl. 
And for almost three months, I felt like this is what's been missing in my life. And yet, I don't know, one night I awakened, like 2 a.m. in the morning, I have to go feed the baby. And it's like this wind blows through this dark house where I live inside in the dark. And I thought, I thought this was going to be it. I thought whatever is missing in my life, this, the baby is what I needed. And yet I love the baby. I love my grandchildren. I love my stepchildren. I love my husband. But I didn't know what, what in the world was wrong. So here's my little girl. She's three years old. I adore her. This lady moves next door to me. She has a year old child. They started telling her the, the scuttlebutt, you're living next door to a miracle. That man and woman were struck by lightning. They're very good people. She is a wonderful woman. She's very dedicated. You know, every time someone would say that, I'd agree with them. I thought I am. I'm probably doing more than anybody I know. It's two of the words that I hate the, the, the most is when people say, you're very good, or what I hate more than that is when you're very religious. Yes. Yeah, I can't stand it when <laughs> someone says you're very good. No, that's the last thing I want to be. But go ahead. Right. <laughs> So this lady, they tell her how good I am, and so she, being the real McCoy, like my dad, looked me over and thought, I really think I'd better pray for this lady. And she saw through my facade, and she started, now we're into sabotage, she starts involving her friends. She said, I want you to help me to pray for her. She's got a mask on. She's scared. She's fearful. She doesn't know the Lord. And so this lady, she's got all her friends praying for me. My dad's praying for me. She's praying for me. And she begins to invite me to different functions. And I said, no, thank you. No, thank you. I've got my own little groupie. And we went on like this for two years. She invited me to everything you can imagine. Finally, I'm 42 years old. My little girl is five. Her little girl is three. She says to me one day, Wilma, I got an invitation for you. You're not going to be able to refuse. I said, oh, try me. And uh, she said, I'm going to invite you to your own country club. And I said, I'm the one that belongs there, you know. How's that for a tacky statement? But I said it. And she says, I know. I think it's a gas. I'm inviting you to your own club. I said, what's going on there? I don't know about She said, well, it's uh, something new in our area. It's not new, but it's new in our area. It's called Christian Women's Club. And their very first meeting, they're having it at your country club. I said, I never heard of it. She said, you have now. they got free babysitters. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> That was it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, you know what? I did say yes that day. But you know the real reason I said yes? I did like the free babysitter. But I really said yes to get that lady off my back. She's hanging in there. She's not going to give up. And I thought, chances are, if it's at my country club, it probably won't be too religious. And that's the truth. That's Mrs. Church. Because, you see, here was my problem. I had my lifestyle set. I'm 42 years of age. And uh, I'm doing all these good things for God, right? I'm now, listen, God, I'm doing everything I can. But my life is my own. And uh, I don't want anyone messing with all the little goodies I got in my life so I can have fun. Now, I haven't had any fun yet, but I might have someday. When it come <laughs> along, I want to be intact with my goodies. And so I didn't want to pick on those little bun of hair up type proposition where people don't have fun. I want to have fun. Even though I haven't had it yet, I might have it someday. And so I walked in that club that day with my guard up. I didn't want anyone messing with me. And Jesus Christ was there that day. <laughs> What happened? <laughs> well, I won the door prize. Never won a door prize before. And, you know, that disarmed me. And then the food was always good at the club. And uh, the music was great. She got up, sang a song from Showboat. And uh, I thought, well, this is not half bad. I, I, what have I been fighting? And, and uh, n now the special feature was this style show. All women love style shows. And I'm beginning to relax. And now this woman that sings gets up and sings her second song. And it's a sacred number. And I thought, well, I suppose they have to do that. This is called Christian Women's Club. And, and uh, now the speaker gets up. And I don't know really what happened to me because, you see, I think you can be a child that sits in Sunday school and church and you don't know, you're just planning what you're going to do as soon as you can cut out. You're not listening. You look like a little angel, but you're not listening. And now you're a big lady in a big body, got the same mentality. You sit in church and you plan the whole week's menus while the man up in front's talking. Everyone thinks you're taking notes. <laughs> and that's, that's a big problem that a lot of people do. They don't listen. And just so happened in my church, I wouldn't hurt anything probably. But uh, I, all of a sudden that day, I think what happened to me that day is something that happens to every person that ever comes into this world. Romans 1 
says, we are without excuse. We know there's a God. I think that at one point he knocks on the bonehead and he says, listen up. And it was like he was, I, was, I had a light go on in me that day. This lady started to share. She said she had a nice husband. I thought, so have I. She started talking about her nice home. I thought, so have I. She said she'd been there. I thought, so have I. She said, well, I've been there. I thought, well, I might go there. And I'm identifying with her. And suddenly she said, wouldn't you think with all this going on in my life, I got a nice life, don't I? But I had nothing. She said, I was empty. There was a spot inside. I didn't have it. And I'm looking at this lady. I thought, good grief. I didn't expect to identify with you this way. Here you got an empty spot like me, and you're telling him, no pride. Just stand up and tell about an empty spot. No way would I ever do that. And then I start looking at her, and suddenly I'm not hearing her. I'm realizing what is happening to me is I'm realizing she has filled her spot up with something. She's talking past tense. And I started really listening. And this lady said, do you know there's a verse in the Bible? It says, Christ said, if I am held up, I will draw all unto me. And she says, you get ready. I'm going to hold up the Son of God. And with that, she used a verse that I could not understand. I could not believe it. I knew the verse. And yet I never listened. But God's words got a way of penetrating boneheads. And she started using John 3.16. And I, I thought, I know that verse. And I, may I give that verse to you? Go ahead. In I paraphrase Wilma fashion that I think is what God is saying in the whole fullness of that verse. For God, the God who is there and the God who is here right now, so loved the unique individual personality of each and every one of us so much, that's the world, that he gave, it's a gift, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ that whosoever, that's you and that's me, if we believe on what the Son has done on the cross when he hung, suspended between earth and heaven and poured his blood out and died in our place, we will not perish while wilderness camping or any other time, but we will have everlasting, we'll have everlasting life. <laughs> that's what I believe it means. All these things that we do trying to earn and merit will not get you one inch off this planet Earth toward God. The only vehicle is Jesus Christ and knowing him in your heart. So what did what happened next? Well, 10 years rolled up like a scroll. I don't I can't explain it. I suddenly as I was listening to her, I suddenly was going through the death experience again. I was in that mode where I heard that moment when I knew that there was a God, and it was as though a voice was started speaking in my spirit. It says, all right, Wilma, this is it. You know now who I am. My name is Jesus Christ. Wilma, our time is up. Did you know the, re by, by what happened to you, did you know the reality of hell, would you say? Yes. I don't know. I, can, I can't explain it. You, because you were being it certainly sucked wasn't into talked a about. You were being sucked into like a darkness. In, yes. Back then, somehow, did you realize this was a, an eternal separation from God? Yes. I knew it because I, my husband and I discussed it. And what happened to me the day that I prayed to receive Christ? I, the, this was 10 years ten later. Years you later. went to a women's meeting at your own country club. Yeah. And everyone looking at you on the outside would say, this is one fulfilled woman. Her picture's in the newspaper. She's on this civic, this charity, this thing, doing these things. And uh, so everyone looking at you say, oh, boy, I'd, I'd like, I, I really like to be like, like you. But this woman said, described herself, and she just it was speaking, described herself just like you and said she was empty. But the thing that was so astounding to you that I got from you is you were wondering why she had, how she had the nerve to tell people what was beyond the facade. Right, because uh, to me, I think that, Wearing a facade are just the thing to do. You don't want anyone to think that you haven't got it made. Um, you, you want everyone to think that you've got it all together. And for a person, it was, that's what disarmed me at first. But then, all of a sudden, when she spoke of Jesus Christ, the moment she spoke of Christ, I'll tell you, the day that this happened to me, I believe, had I not prayed and asked Christ into my heart that day, I say this in all sincerity, I don't know if I would have ever had another chance. I believe that I knew enough that day. I believe that my father's prayers had protected me, and his prayers had prayed me up to a certain point till I knew 
what the Son had done for me. I was listening to what he had done for me. The power of the Holy Spirit was all over that room. And there was no way I could miss. And then when I felt his presence speaking inside of me, I, I honestly believe. And you know what? I am no bargain for God. I tried to make a deal with him that if he'd wait till I went home, I'd ask him to, in my heart. But I didn't want to do it in that room full of women that a lot of them thought I was a Christian. And you know... That, that had to be very embarrassing it, for you to was. stand up. This is your own country club. Yes. It, they just happened to be meeting there. And this neighbor of mine, I didn't want... And I was cracking up. And, you know, I thought I'm going to cry. And when I cry, my nose runs. I didn't want to cry. And I was trying to make Jesus wait. Don't do it. I'll come... I'll go home. We'll get in the closet and we'll talk this over. All I can tell you is it was easier to let the love come in than to hold love like that out. And I can't even talk about it today without cracking up because the love of Jesus Christ is so real that when you open your heart's door and he comes in, he, he has just filled every atom of my being with his peace. And I have problems. It's, my book has got a lot of problems where God has met me. I have found out that the sufficiency of Jesus Christ is totally there. And I'm a slow learner. I proved that. That I come along here at 42. I finally get my act. But you know, I have found out that you can trust God with every circumstance of your life. And I found out that a lot of people are fearful of dying. If someone had said to me that day, prior to my making that prayer, if they said, Wilma, what do you think? You've been working hard now for 10 years. Do you think if you were to die now, do you think you would go toward God? I would have said to them, listen, there's no way you can know something like that. I mean, I hope so. I'm trying. That's what you mo can't most know Christians it. say when I, when I say to them, do you know for sure you would be in heaven? They, they will say, I hope. I hope. And you see, that is a lie. You can't, because the Bible says, these things are written that you might know you have eternal life. He that hath the Son has life. He that hath not the Son has not life. Jesus Christ said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But you can miss it. The Father said, to as many as receive him, my son, I'll give you the authority to be my child. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto God the Father except by me. And so it's by Jesus Christ in no other way. So all right, your challenge, you, did you actually have a feeling if you did not stand up, that might have been your last call? Yes. And, and so what did yes. you do? And I tried to, I wanted him to wait till I got home, but you wanted I did You wanted to do it in your closet. <laughs> yes, but I, I ended up, my nose ran and I prayed and I asked him in. Then they said, now if you ask Christ into your heart, you're my sister, this lady said. And she said, I love you, and I want to pray for you. I want you to take your name tag and hand it to me at the door. And I'm thinking, no way am I going to take my name tag off and hand it to a lady at the door. And I take it off, I pull the pin out, I'm wadding it up. I start to put it in my blazer pocket, and there's a voice speaks in my, <laughs> my head, and it says, listen, first orders from your new boss, hand the name tag to the lady. I know, listen, I know you're in here. We know it. Let's, he says, no. He said, I'm not ashamed of you. Don't be ashamed of me. I thought, I'm not going to do it. God, I'm not going to. He says, do it. And you know, when I got to the door, I got my hand watered up around this name tag in my blazer pocket. And this speaker, hands, hands, she wants to shake hands with me. And that's my hand. I, so I palmed it. I palmed it. <laughs> what a, I'm no bargain. I palmed it. And then I thought, if my neighbor saw that, I'll die. She saw it. She goes home. She said, she calls up her friend. She says, what will I do? I know she prayed, but she, she told me, I'll take you to lunch now. Where would you like to go? And she said, I know she prayed. She handed her, she sneaked it into, and they said, listen, the way you've been describing her, leave her alone. If the Holy Spirit really came into her life, he'll show good advice. Because if that lady had said anything to me, if Joan had said, I would have said, what? How dare you? I was born again, but I still was just totally filled with me, and I didn't want and so she didn't say anything. That's why I know the power of the Holy Spirit. No help at all. You know, I thought, where's my Bible? I first thing, I ran in my house. I got on my knees, and I cried. I cried, like, for two hours. I didn't even know why I was crying. I got up, blew my nose out. Now i got to make dinner. I hate doing that after I've been to lunch. And I go down, I thought, you did that. You did that. 
Now I start to try to find my Bible. I'd walk down the aisle with one little white ribbons of orchids on it when I got married. I thought, where is it? I finally found it in the guest bedroom in a drawer. And I lived in a five-level house in Minneapolis in those days. And I used to go up in the guest room on the fourth level up, and I'd pull the blinds, and no one could see me. And, you know, the birds and the trees, maybe. And I'd read this, what I had thought, archaic book, and I understood it. And, you know, I started in Jeremiah and Daniel. <laughs> it just that's, so happened. <laughs> that's heavy. Let me ask you a question. What was the difference after you said that prayer and Jesus became real to you from, from before? What was the difference? What was the difference? Peace. Incredible peace. So great that my husband said, what's happened to you? And I thought, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my husband. What am I going to do? Listen, I tried to fight what had happened to me. I am, I say again, I'm no bargain, but oh, God is so great. He just kept saying, tell him I'm in here. And I, I ended up telling my husband, and you know, my husband, my stepdaughter, my twin sons and their mates, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law all received Jesus Christ within a year's time because of the reality of Jesus Christ in my life. What was different? I don't know. I still seem to talk the same, except my husband knew that, that something had happened. How, how does someone know whether they know Jesus or whether they know about him? How, if you have a fear of death, I would really question whether you really know Jesus Christ. Because he doesn't give, her, give us fear. He gives us power, love, and a sound mind. And I believe if you have a fear, and I speak and have been speaking for well over 20 years now, and I find women all the time who have a fear. There were 28 women today, for example, in the club that I spoke for that prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come into their life. They're, they're fearful. They're not sure. Wilma, that they're depending on Christ. Wilma, just because of the time constraint, we're going to believe that the Holy Spirit right now is going to reveal Jesus to every single person that wants to know him. I want you to say out loud, even if you're alone, I want you to say out loud this prayer. Dear God, Dear God please forgive me please forgive me for every sin I've ever committed. For every sin I've ever committed. Those that I know about those that I know about. And those that I don't know about. And those that I don't know about. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. And rose from the dead. And rose from the dead. And by his wounds. And by his wounds. I am forgiven. I am forgiven. I am clean. I am clean. And now that I am clean. Now that I am clean. I ask Jesus to be my Lord. I ask Jesus to be my Lord. And to live inside of me. And to live inside of me. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me, Holy Spirit. I need more of God. I need more of God. Amen. Amen. If you said that prayer and meant it, the same thing that happened to Wilma, the same thing that happened to me, the same thing that happened to her husband and to the other members of her family, it's just happened to you. Chapter 22. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment, and he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. 
There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel according to John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Chapter 3 There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, he must be born again. 